I'm Mary Trosk, I'm Clea's Executive Director, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's presentation on Small Claims Court. Uh, this is our last webinar of um, 2021. We'll have a whole new series starting in, in, in hopefully January. And um, tonight's webinar is being recorded and we'll let you know when the recording is available. We'll also let you know when the uh, new webinars are going to be starting. I'll send everybody an email. So we acknowledge that CLIA's office is located on Treaty 1 territory, the traditional gathering place of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota and Dene people is traditional homeland of the Métis people. Winnipeg's water is sourced from Shoal Lake 40 First Nation. We acknowledge that much harm was done in the past and dedicate ourselves to move forward in the spirit of reconciliation. So I want to tell you a little bit about our presenter. Daniel lives in Winnipeg with his wife, two kids and two cats. He practices law with Wolseley Law LLP. Previously, he articled and practiced with Levine Tadman Golub. Daniel practiced primarily in the areas of employment law, litigation, and refugee protection claims. He received his Bachelor of Arts from the University of Winnipeg and his law degree from the University of Manitoba. He was called to the bar in 2014, and he's currently completing his Master's of Law from New York University. Daniel says that he was the most nervous he's ever been before court when he did his first small claim trial as an article student. So tonight I'm sure he's not nervous and I'm sure he'll tell you all about small claims so you won't be as either. And I'm going to basically turn over to Daniel. Thank you. Well, thanks for that introduction, Mary. Um, I wouldn't uh, say I'm not nervous, but uh, maybe not as much as my first small claims trial. Um, I'll start just by making a couple uh, disclaimers. Um, if I can get my presentation to move. Um, the information, this is a presentation that's just uh, legal information. Um, this is an advice. Every situation is a little bit different. Um, I might describe situations that sound like something that people are experiencing, but I'm trying to just stay at the level of generic information and um, nothing can be taken as advice. And it's also not confidential. So uh, keep that in mind if uh, you ask any questions. Uh, it's a small province and uh, you never know who's on the call. Um, so I guess to start, um, we're talking about small claims court. Um, and the big question, I guess, is why would people use small claims court? Um, well, um, we'll talk a lot about the, the procedures and, and, and um, what it takes to, to get a, 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 a claim from the filing stage to the um, to the hearing. But really the, the reason why people would use small claims court is because there isn't really very many of those procedures. It's a, it's a very simple, uh, uh, simple process that gets you uh, to your day in court um, very quickly, relatively quickly, um, and usually without, um, without so much energy expended compared to uh, the way things play out in regular court. Um, because it's, you know, the procedures are relaxed um, and because of its informality, it is restricted to uh, claims that are relatively small, relatively, $15,000 is still a fair bit of money for most of us, but um, it is restricted to claims that are under that threshold. Um, it can also be used in, in some uh, to assign the uh, fault for car accidents, but we won't really get into that too much unless people have questions. Um, and because uh, of the informality, there's also um, some areas of small claims court that are not, uh, cannot be handled, even if they are under $15,000. Uh, just to go over what those are, that's up there on the slide. Um, for many of those, it's because they're just too complicated, um, that it's not appropriate to use small claims court usually for, for resolving them. In some cases, uh, for example, landlord and tenant disputes, it's because we actually have a specialized tribunal. It's in some ways quite similar to small claims court uh, that will handle those. Um, and sometimes there are cases that are a little bit on the line, but um, those are 
issues of jurisdiction that can sometimes pop up, but we'll get into that later. But just uh, the main takeaway is that not just because a matter is for less than $15,000 doesn't mean it automatically falls into the under the jurisdiction of small claims court. Um, if we're talking about small claims court, there's a few different uh, players that we should be aware of, and I'll just sort of go through uh, who those are and what their roles are. Um, well, starting with um, court registry staff, um, these would be the people that you'd meet behind the counter. In Winnipeg, it would be at 408 York where you file your claim. Uh, they're the ones that initially are going to take the Form 76A, which is the document that starts your small claim. They're going to assign it a day in court for a first returnable day, uh, and they'll stamp it. Um, and these, the registry staff would also have some, um, some limited powers to do things like they can grant orders extending time to serve, and I believe uh, they are permitted to give uh, orders of substitutional service. Although I haven't done that for a while, I have to double check that. Um, the next person would be we have is the screening court officer. This would be the first person um, after a claim is filed and it goes to the, the first date that the court assigns. This is the person that sits in the place of the judge. Uh, small claims are not heard by judges except in a few exceptional uh, situations. Uh, generally, they're heard by court officers, and the first court officer that uh, gets the, the claim, uh, they have a screening function, and they would review the, the case, they would assess how many witnesses are going to be called, how much court time is going to be needed to, to deal with the case. Um, and they may ultimately be the court officer that hears the case, but not necessarily. Uh, the court officer would be the person who's the judge uh, in um, this is the person that's going to actually hear and consider the evidence uh, and make a decision. Uh, who the parties are is fairly self-explanatory. These are the people or corporations that are suing or being sued. Um, and we can also have third parties get involved, which would be um, those parties not initially part of the proceeding but uh, are brought in because usually the defendant uh, has said that there's you know another party that should be assigned uh, blame. Um, litigation guardian would be a rare rarer uh, party that you would encounter but th that's for uh, uh, children or people with disabilities who've had a, uh, another party appointed who can uh, handle litigation on their behalf. Uh, witnesses would be people that are brought to court to testify and give our evidence uh, by a party. Unlike a party, a witness, a party could be a witness, of course, but um, otherwise witnesses uh, are going to be required to wait in the hallway uh, before they testify. And lawyers, unfortunately, still do pop up sometimes at small claims court. Um, it's relatively rare, uh, but not, not uncommon. It, it does happen. Uh, because there is a, uh, under the legislation, there's a fairly low um, amount of money that parties can uh, expect to get if they're successful for their lawyer fees. Uh, it's generally not seen as nearly what it would cost to hire a lawyer. So uh, for that reason, uh, lawyers are relatively, um, uh, relatively rare in small claim court, but they can be there. And Parties definitely have the right to be represented by lawyers if they want. Uh, and you'll also encounter sheriffs in, in the courtroom occasionally, and they will deal with uh, security issues. And they also will uh, handle if your witnesses are arriving and you, they, they may be the one that actually sends the message to you that your witness is waiting outside the courtroom wondering what they're supposed to do. Um, in terms of the documents, um, there are a number of documents that will be encountered when you're in small claims court. Um, they're all available online. They're all very um, straightforward uh, for the most part. They're fairly user-friendly. If people have questions, maybe we could 
specific questions about different ones. Um, we could deal with that at the end, uh, but there we may uh, pop into them throughout the presentation. Um, you have your 76A is the small claim document that starts the process. Um, and that's, uh, I, I'm not going to go through them all right now, except just to say that they are there. And um, you will, if you're going to be doing one, you, you're going to get to know them better. Um, um, so to start a claim, um, you need to fill out a form 76A. That's the document that starts a claim. And um, the main thing, they, it's a very uh, straightforward document. You can give a summary, a short summary of what the, the matter is all about, but it's um, compared to a regular lawsuit, it's a very, um, it's very brief what they're expecting from you. Um, the, the main thing that you're gonna wanna make sure that uh, you get right is that you identify the parties correctly. And for businesses, that can be the one that's maybe especially tricky. Uh, and so if necessary, you wanna make sure uh, that you have done a corporate search, if it's a corporation and make sure that you've identified the corporation correctly, uh, figure out who the officer is uh, that, that can be served. And um, if it's a numbered corporation, make sure you get the number right. Um, and those kinds of things can be uh, figured out through the company's office. Um, and there is, I think, a $5 fee for a company search right now. Um, and that could be recoverable, arguably, as part of your costs at the end of the hearing. Um, but ultimately, you take your Form 76A and you go to your nearest court office and um, you bring us several copies of the uh, claim, enough copies, because you're going to need stamped uh, filed copies to serve on every defendant that is a uh, party to the, to the small claim. And uh, you pay your filing fee, which is $50 or $75, depending on the size of the claim. And then you'll have a, a claim that has a court date on it. And you can proceed from there to serve your small claim. Um, you should serve your claim, or a claimant should serve their claim pretty much right away. You have under the rules 30 days. Um, you can get an extension, but um, you'd normally need to provide a reason for why, um, why that is that you need more time. And serving the claim uh, means mostly, it means personally delivering it to the person, uh, the defendant. Um, if you are at their residence and somebody else answers the door who appears to be over 16 years old, uh, that, can be, um, that can be an adequate service. Uh, and you can also serve it by registered mail, uh, but it's not just enough to send it by registered mail, it actually has to be received and you're gonna have to provide uh, those documents that the post office will provide you, uh, which actually provide the, uh, the proof that the person got it and, and the signature. Um, if it's a company that is the defendant, you can serve the company by going to their place of business and giving it to the person who appears to be uh, in control of the premises, uh, or you could serve the, a, an officer of the corporation. Uh, and that's back to that company's office search that I was talking about where you would get that information. Um, once the claim is served, um, you need to provide proof of service to the court and that can be done with a declaration of service or an affidavit. Um, and normally uh, we used to say, bring the, just bring it to the hearing, but now with the, the first hearing tends to be, uh, I think it is still always being done by phone. So you're gonna wanna file uh, your proof of service with the court well before the hearing um, so that it's on file because uh, it's if you're going to be asking for default judgment or if the other um, if the other party doesn't show up, it's going to be an important uh, document that, that the court is going to look at uh, quite carefully. Um, 
if you are not able to serve the uh, the defendant, this is not an uncommon problem. Perhaps the defendant keeps running away, seems to be avoiding service, uh, or they've just vanished without a trace, and you can't um, can't find um, just you can't find any leads on them. Uh, you can either get an order extending time if it seems appropriate, if you think that you know they're just out of the country, but they'll be back next month. Uh, you can get that from the uh, from the court registry office, or you can, um, if you provide the information that can be a, a sufficient foundation for it, you can get an order of substitutional service, which will let you do something less than personal service. Um, and it really does depend completely on what the facts are. And, you know, depending on, on what you can tell the court about the situation, uh, it will really uh, determine what the uh, court registry is going to say is the right, um, right order of substitutional service. But it could be something like just sending it to them in the mail uh, if it seems like the person's avoiding service and inside their house but just won't answer the door, that might be enough. Um, or if they've really vanished without a trace, it might be like a legal notice in the... Uh, in the newspaper, but that just depends um, completely on the facts. Um, once the claim has been filed, we have a relatively new step now. This wasn't the case uh, the last time I was in small claims court, but uh, the defendant is now required to fill out um, a form 76B, which is a statement of, which is a, a something like a statement of defense. Uh, the defendant is um, can either deny that they owe the claimant what the claimant says and provide a brief and very brief uh, reasons, um, or they can admit liability but ask for time to pay. In some cases, um, the defendant will also want to file a um, counterclaim. Um, this might be common for example, that would be in the situation where basically the defense says, not only do I not owe this person anything, they actually owe me something. So you might have a, a in example that we commonly would see would be a renovation job and the builder says that they're still owed um, money, but once they serve the uh, the claim for their unpaid invoice, the homeowner comes forward and says, no, it's actually, the work was done quite poorly. And actually, I'm the one who's owed money by this person. And um, obviously, those claims need to be heard at the same time. Um, and so in that case, the claimant should get ready to uh, defend. They're, they're going to have to uh, also uh, defend as well as prosecute their claim. Um, when somebody is not named as a party initially, but but might, uh, but the defendant perhaps thinks that they're responsible, uh, they can bring a third party claim and bring that additional party into the uh, proceeding. If we go back to the contractor scenario, you'd often see a situation where maybe the builder now thinks that there's a, a subcontractor that is responsible. Uh, and that third party is gonna have the same opportunity to uh, put forward their side of the story and uh, participate in the proceeding. And uh, yeah, so um, that's that's third party claims and they can be, um, they can happen. Um, you can, in uh, small claims court, there's no reason why you can't settle pretty much at any time. You can even settle it I've seen uh, after the hearing has started if you want to take a if it feels like the right thing to do and parties want to agree the court is generally always happy to uh, not have to work that day and free up their schedule if, if the parties settle right outside the door they'll be happy to uh, cancel the hearing um, there's obviously pros and cons to settlement generally it's a uh, uh, you know, there's certainty of outcome uh, and it can usually be confidential, which some people like, uh, but generally you're going to have to make some compromises. Um, 
once a settlement is made, it often happens that, you know, a lot of cases do settle on the doorsteps uh, of the court. Um, and maybe the, the settlement is going to include the defendant making payments over a period of time. Um, but if you're the claimant in that scenario, you probably don't want to just, in fact, you definitely do not want to just drop your claim uh, until you've um, confirmed that the payments actually are going to be made as has been agreed. So what you can do is you can adjourn the claim pending settlement. And um, you know if there's going to be payments over two months, you might adjourn the case to another day about two or three months ahead of them and, and then come back. Uh, but if the payments are made, then are not made, then you are, as the claimant, are still in a position that you can proceed um, without starting things all over again. It's also sometimes uh, settle cases can be settled by the defendant agreeing to consent to judgment. Uh, that's um, you know that would actually not be confidential then I guess because that would be on the court registry, but uh, it can. It definitely be a, a tool that you can use to fashion a settlement um, and the court will happily you know put things on the record and and enter the judgment um, as needed but uh, once the claimant is fully paid for their claim though it is the claimant that does bear the responsibility for discontinuing the claim uh, which i think at this point can actually be done with a uh, an email to the uh, court Now, um, how do we uh, prepare for a hearing? Let's say that now we've gone through the screening officer. Uh, they've we've listed our witnesses, and um, the matter has been set down, and everybody arrives at the trial as expected, and um, we're ready to go uh, with our with our, our small claim trial. How do we prepare for that? Um, I think it's really um, a useful exercise to really go through, uh, if you're the claimant or if you're the defendant, it would just be a little bit, put yourself in, a, in the mirror of this, but uh, break down into the most um, small chunks of information that you possibly can. Uh, what are the facts? Um, that I need to establish that entitle me to the thing that I'm asking the court to do uh, and make sure I have, you know, what are the documents that I need to gather. Um, and I thought maybe the easiest way to go through this that would be um, maybe a little bit more engaging would be to just think through uh, a kind of case that we see all the time um, and, and just go through each step how how you would approach it. So we have often we see with uh, real estate transactions uh, at the end of it, there's often a, a clause that the appliances will be in good working order um, on the date of possession. Um, so, you know, if you're going through approaching this, often what happens is that the, uh, the purchaser gets there on the date of possession and, um, you know, the oven doesn't work. So if you're going to approach this problem from the perspective of the claimant, you want to start with first, um, you know, first number of fact, number one, there is a contract and it's signed by both the parties. So I'm going to make, and I want to have a copy of that contract. Fact number two, um, there's a clause in the contract that says that the, the oven will be in good working order on the date of possession. Fact number three, on the date of possession, I went into the house. I discovered that the oven was not working. I took a picture of it. Uh, here's a picture. That's my second document I want to have. Fact number five, I called this oven repair place and a technician came out who visited my house. Uh, the technician confirmed that the, uh, the oven's broken and couldn't be repaired. That technician charged me hundred dollars. Here's my invoice. Put that in my pile of documents. Um, I went to the uh, store. I purchased a similar oven. 
I talked to somebody at the store, they confirmed that the model that I was buying was relatively similar in the same class of oven as the one that I had to replace. Um, and I was charged $1,000 for my new oven. And I was charged another $250 for my, um, for the installation, let's say. So I wanna also go through and I wanna calculate all the different places where I was paid. I was out of pocket money on this and I have the source document, I wanna add those up. Um, I wanna, I also wanna probably, it's the kind of situation where I might need to actually bring that technician to court uh, as a witness to establish that the oven didn't work. So I'm going to probably want that witness. Maybe I also want to bring the witness from the store who can confirm that the, the oven that I purchased is in the same, uh, same category as the oven that I had to replace. Um, I'm going to make a little script for all the questions. I'm going to ask those witnesses. And um, I'm going to also make sure I have three copies of every single document that I'm going to bring to court on this claim, uh, which would include you know, the invoices, the contract, the photographs, um, all those kind of things. Now, it's not always the case that witnesses are happy to come to court, not but there is a tool called the subpoena that uh, we have access to when we use small claims court, where if somebody doesn't want to come and testify, but if they have evidence that's important for your case, uh, you can get the court to issue a subpoena and that person will be then required to come to court. Um, and the document that they'll be served with will actually say, if you don't come, there's going to be a warrant out for your arrest. Um, it's important to, you know, if, if a witness is important to your case and you don't think that you can make the claim out sufficiently without that witness, it is really important that you either use a subpoena or confirm in writing if it's somebody who you're on good terms with, uh, you know, that they're gonna be coming. Because if you get to that trial and your witnesses aren't showing up, uh, you're going to have a problem where maybe you can't, if you may not be able to proceed uh, and still have a good shot at, at winning the case. So you probably are going to be wanting to ask the court for an adjournment, which they generally don't like granting because they want things to move forward uh, quickly. But you're going to be in a much better position to get an adjournment if you, um, in the case of a subpoena, if somebody has violated a subpoena, you'll almost certainly get this, the the um, the adjournment, or if, if you've shown that you know you did everything reasonable to confirm that the person would come and you're not sure why they're not there, uh, you know, the court is more likely to give you that adjournment, uh, which will you know hopefully keep your case alive. Um, it's a good idea definitely to, to meet with your witnesses before the hearing uh, and and go over what you expect them to say on the stand, uh, and go over the questions that you're going to be asking them. Um, it's, um, it would rarely go well if you didn't do that. Although with witnesses that are under subpoena, you're going to have a little bit more trouble maybe. Uh, but, um, yeah, preparation is always, uh, very important, uh, when you're working with your witnesses. Um, in terms of how to get a subpoena, there's, um, two forms that need to be filled out. Um, the subpoena form itself actually has the formula of how you calculate your attendance money that needs to be provided to the witness. Uh, if you do subpoena a witness, that witness is required uh, or is entitled to um, attendance money. Um, the calculation of that is based on how long the witness is expected to be uh, in court. The shortest increment is half a day, and I think it starts at about $36. Uh, and the witness would also be entitled to four or five dollars for their travel if they're uh, if it's somebody in Winnipeg and the hearing is in Winnipeg, uh, and then if they're outside of Winnipeg, there's a, a calculation based on kilometers. Um, but you have to um, provide the witness with that money if you uh, 
if you for them to be uh, under the subpoena and be required to attend. Um, now, what happens at the hearing? Um, it, the case will, once you've actually gotten to your trial, um, there's a pretty, um, it's, it's, it's a, a pretty simple process, but it's a, it, 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 it um, it happens in a, a certain order, uh, and it happens in that order for, for good reasons that go back uh, a long time. Uh, but the claimant will go first. Um, after the, co the court officer comes out and probably will ask one more time if um, the parties, there's any chance of settlement. Um, if there isn't, then they'll proceed to ask uh, if the claimant is ready to go ahead. Uh, the claimant can make an opening statement. Um, it's a good idea to make one, but it's definitely not the time to um, make the passionate speech where you win the case. This is before any evidence has gone in. Uh, this is simply a chance for the claimant to give a quick roadmap uh, to, the, to the hearing officer of what, what they're going to be doing there that morning. Um, you wouldn't really expect an opening statement of much more than uh, a good opening statement at small claims court should be about 30 seconds to a minute. Um, in, in the case of the oven, uh, that I, I described before, you know, it might just be as simple as, uh, good morning, madam, I'm the claimant. I'm here claiming damages that I incurred as a result of a breach of contract that I alleged by the defendant to establish my claim. I'm going to be calling, uh, two witnesses, myself and, uh, John, the oven technician. Uh, I expect that my evidence will take about uh, two hours to get through and I'm ready to start now. And that would pretty much say everything that needs to be said, uh, in my opinion. Um, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of activity at small claims court. The, the court officers seem to have a lot to do, so they definitely don't really want to uh, hear long meandering statements about um, grandiose things. Um, because they certainly get that occasionally, and um, I think uh, you can endear yourself more, much more to your, your hearing officer by, by staying really focused on, uh, on the issues and not, um, and not getting lost in the weeds. Um, after your opening statement, the claimant, and I'm always assuming the claimant is, is the you in this story, but... Um, the claimant will then give their evidence. They would usually call themselves. If the claimant is giving evidence, they would usually go first. Uh, they would do a direct examination, or if they're just giving evidence, they can just sort of speak extemporaneously under oath. Uh, and after that, um, every witness is subject to cross-examination by the other side. Um, and we'll get into direct and uh, cross-examination in a minute, um, but that's, that's, basically, um, that's basically it. Once the last witness for the claimant's case has testified and been cross-examined, the claimant would close their case and the defendant would then be able to do their side. And they can do an opening statement the same way, um, a quick summary of where they're planning to go with their, their evidence, um, and then they can start to call their witnesses. And same thing, direct examination by the defendant, followed by a cross-examination by the claimant. And once both sides have finished putting in their evidence, they can each make a closing statement and um, then a decision will be made. Um, in terms of the witnesses, um, it's just like the opening statement. This is a, a really important thing that uh, I can't stress enough, I think is, um, prepare, but also stay um, really focused on Okay, I, I think I'll, I'll get to questions. I'm pretty close to the end. I think I have five more minutes. So maybe if it's okay uh, with the person asking the question, I will uh, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll do questions in about, I'm only probably about five or ten minutes. So I'm going to just wait to get to questions then, but I'll, I'll make a note of that one and we'll get to that right away. Um, 
so um, like I said, it's good to um, ask questions. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, making a list of the questions and the, the evidence that you intend to get from the witness is um, a really good idea. You should have sort of a separate roadmap for each witness. As the witness is going through the things that you expect them to say, you're probably going to be crossing it off. Make sure that they're, you know, getting all the points that you hope them to hope that they're going to make. And then, you know, don't stop uh, your examination until you've crossed off everything that you were hoping to get from your witness. Um, generally, you would only call a witness when you know what they're going to say, um, and only ask the que questions to the witness that you already know the answer to. Um, this is, we're talking mainly about um, direct examinations here. Um, when you're doing your direct examination, uh, you're required, although things are looser at small claims court, um, you are still required to use um, open-ended questions that don't suggest their own answer. Um, and for practical reasons, you probably, it's not a good idea to be using too many leading questions with your own witnesses because the court really wants to have a chance to hear those witnesses speak in their own words and make an assessment of what kind of a, a witnesses that you're presenting. So if, if you're just simply like rattling off a bunch of facts and getting your witness to uh, agree to them and then saying, that's it, case closed, or this witness, that's all I needed from them. Um, the court's not really going to have much of a sense of what that witness gave them, and they're probably going to be, um, uh, you know, they're going to be very, um, you know, it's going to be very hard for them to assess the credibility, so they probably aren't going to give it the same weight that maybe they would have if they could have just heard the, the witness describe what they, they knew about. So uh, you want to kind of, that's why you really do need to prepare with the witness, let them know what kind of questions you're going to be asking them, and what where you expect them to go with it. Um, as you're going uh, through your evidence, you may um, be tendering your documents into evidence. Um, so um, for example, you know, if you have the technician um, in the oven situation, uh, you know, you might show them a copy of the, the notes that they took on the day of the, um, uh, the day of the inspection of the oven. Uh, the person would then, you know, confirm, yes, this is my, uh, this is my writing. This is the, the report I repaired, I prepared. Uh, and then you would ask the hearing officer to put that into evidence as an exhibit. And that's why you got to have then three copies. So that one copy goes to the, the hearing officer, one copy for the other side and one copy for yourself. And as you're putting in your exhibits, um, into evidence, you want to make make sure you make a nice list for yourself so that you remember. You know, the contract is Exhibit One, the photographs are Exhibit Two, because in your closing submission, you're going to be referring back to those, um, and uh, you want to make sure you know you remember which which number refers to which document. Um, so. Again, uh, keeping your witnesses as much as possible, though, you don't want them to meander. Um, Although you do have to give them some opportunity to kind of speak however they want to speak by asking open questions, but you want to try to keep them focused on the, the relevant issues that you brought them to court for um, and not and, and not straying from that too much. Um, after the direct examination is finished, the other side has the opportunity to uh, do a cross examination and there really it's the complete opposite um, approach unlike um, unlike direct exam where questions cannot be leading on a cross-examination questions actually have to be lead or they should be leading uh, the court won't stop you from not asking leading questions but as a um, just for for strategic reasons you only want to be asking leading questions if you ask an open-ended question to the uh, witness for the other side, they're probably just going to keep talking and saying things that they've already said, and they're going to say it in ways that um, probably are going to benefit the, the, the party that called them. Um, but you really just want to stick to putting, getting very, very simple admissions from them, yes or no kind of questions. And a lot of lawyers have 
kind of have this sort of reflex that we use for cross-examination where you keep uh, just keep making sure that your question ends with, isn't that correct? Isn't that correct? So, um, and you really don't want to be getting questions or answers from them that are much different than a yes or a no, or an I don't know, perhaps. Um, so perhaps if you're the defendant in the, um, in the oven case, and you're part of your defense is that maybe the technician is the, you know, a close friend of the person of the claimant, and that, you know, maybe that witness doesn't have uh, as much credibility because they're, you know, basically just testifying. Uh, you know, they have a vested interest in helping the, the claimant more than, uh, more than should otherwise uh, be the case. You want to make sure that that's brought to the court's attention. So you're just going to maybe just, just get them to confirm that you're friends with the claimant. Isn't that correct? Yes. And then you don't really want to get more than that because um they're just going to probably spin that into something that helps uh the other side so you just try as best as you can to just get get the admissions that you think could be helpful for your case um but cross-examination is not um it's probably one of the hardest parts of, of this process but it can be a little bit of fun uh Afterwards, it usually makes some people, I think, have some good stories of the uh, matlock moments at small claims court. Um, once all of the uh, witnesses have been examined and cross-examined, both sides have put in their cases. Um, now both sides have the opportunity to make their closing argument. Um, what um, you need to do is you need to refer back to the evidence that you've put uh, before the court and that the other side is put before the court and you need to point out you know where the evidence came that that establishes that your claim has merit and that you should get the thing that you're asking the court to do which in the claimant's case is your side is usually going to be you know that they get the judgment and the defendant's side is going to be you know that they don't get the judgment or that uh, maybe it's for less than the claimant is asking for um, as best as you can refer specifically to the things that the witnesses said and, and refer to the documents that have been put into evidence. If there's contradictory evidence on a certain point, try to explain why the court should prefer one bit of evidence and, and disregard another bit of evidence. Um, it's occasionally done, and although it's not usually necessary for most kinds of cases at small claims court, but you can definitely uh, if you've done legal research and you know of uh, precedent court cases that are are helpful to you, you can bring that to the court's attention. If you are going to bring a court case, though, or a precedent case, you probably, again, you need to bring three copies uh, because the other side should, has to be presented with it and, uh, and one for the judge or for the hearing officer as well. Same thing if there's, you know, legislation that's relevant and you think um, impacts the way that the court should make its decision, bring that to their attention, but also bring, you know, three copies of everything. Um, you can ask for cost. Generally, that would be done, though, after the decision has been made. Uh, then you can, if the, the side that wins would generally be entitled to some compensation for their costs, uh, which would be not the costs that they've brought the claim over, but rather the costs that they incurred after they filed it. So there's your filing fee, the cost of serving the defendant, or the if you're the defendant and you're successful, the cost of serving the claimant. Um, corporate searches, uh, maybe photocopying. They're pretty. Um, it's it's not it's not a very it's a very narrow uh, view that the court takes of what costs uh, were who can be compensated. They have to be. Uh, really directly incurred in, as a result of the proceeding. Um, and then you'll usually receive your decision if if it's um, if the if the case is finished at 11 o'clock, they'll probably say come back after lunch for the decision. Uh, if it's 4.30, they might say, you know, you'll have to come back on another day. In fact, I don't think you actually would come back. I think now that decisions are being sent out, uh, I could be wrong on that, but uh, I, I think, uh, yeah, it, it, it depends if it's a fairly complicated or if it's a close call, then the, the hearing officer might wanna take some time and, 
and write a decision. Uh, and that might take a few weeks. Um, rarely would it take more than a month or two though. Um, and once you have your decision, uh, if it's not appealed after 30 days, there are collection options. If you are uh, the successful party, uh, there's tools that the court offers such as garnishments, uh, liens, but um, that's another topic. Um, you can uh, appeal a court, uh, a small claim decision, uh, but you need leave now and it's only on questions of law or jurisdiction. So earlier on, I know, um, there's sometimes cases, um, maybe it's a close call. Uh, I've heard of recently, you know, separated spouses that were divorced that brought a small claim over uh, a TV. And that could be, a, you know, it's maybe on the line between a, a family case or a small claim. If you think that the court made the wrong decision on a thing like that, then the court will usually give leave for, for an appeal to Queen's Bench. But uh, findings of fact, you're pretty much uh, stuck with after that hearing. So if the court finds that's, um, you know, that the, as a matter of fact, that the oven was broken, and even though it doesn't seem right to you, um, you may basically be stuck with that uh, as a party to the proceeding, because uh, the appeal court is not going to be interested or, or just they, they're not going to be willing to, to um, change a finding of fact. Um, and from there, there could be further appeals to the Court of Appeal, and, but that would be pretty rare, um, I would think. But that would conclude the PowerPoint. Um, but I think so maybe there's some questions. I saw that there was one earlier and I'll read it out. Um, so the question that I had earlier about um, Hi, hello, I'm a claimant and I have a first hearing at the Small Claims Court in January of 2022. It will be a phone and conference call. How can I prevent evidence and facts if it happens not in person? So the first uh, hearing um, that we, that will be still at the stage of, um, um, that's the screening officer that you're gonna have at your first hearing. Uh, that's probably not going to be um, that's not going to be the the um, actual hearing of the case. So what has been happening? Uh, I think there may be in some rare cases they may hear things over the phone, but for the most part, um, what uh, what I had recently, uh, we had our 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 screening officer. Uh, we phoned in. We we discussed how many witnesses we were calling, all the documents. And we agreed to exchange our documents. And then the matter was actually set down for the in-person trial. So um, they're usually, at that stage, they're not going to be expecting you to be um, doing any cross-examination or submitting any documents. Although I believe now you are supposed to attach your documents um, to your claim. Um, but if it's a first appearance, there probably would not be, um, not be any um, um, any presentation of evidence uh, or, or um, dealing with the claim. So I, I hope that answers the question. Okay, and I guess if, if we have other questions, uh, Diane, I'd be more than happy to answer them. I know it takes a bit of time with all the typing, so we'll wait a couple of minutes to see if people have questions. That's actually something that question did. I don't think that the presentation covered is that now you are supposed to submit all your documents um, at the time that you file the claim. I mean, they will let you file. I would assume that you'd still be able to file them later, uh, but they do now ask that the documents be uh, filed along with the 76A. Um, and I think that maybe it was a COVID uh, development to try to keep things um, you know, to try to manage the all these remote processes that we're dealing with. 